All right, it looks like we have a good audience today. Let's give it a couple more minutes and we get started. Okay, okay, thanks. And I just posted the link to the meeting notes, so if you can please add yourself as an attendee. All right, so we're past three minutes, so I think we can get started. So uh, today we have Kai Sun Chen. He's uh, going to be talking to us about Q-Ray, Ray's uh, high-performance network that a lot of different teams and organizations use to run machine learning uh, pipelines and training and serving uh, the whole works uh, for machine learning. Uh, and Cube Ray is a it's a project that allows you to run this on on top of Kubernetes. So yeah, happy to have you and uh, take it away. Yeah, and thanks. Uh, yeah, and uh, uh I am Kaishin, and I am mainly working on the uh, Cube Ray in N scale. And uh, today is that uh our team from the Cube Ray uh we 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 plan to contribute uh. Kubray to the CNCF, so uh, we want to collect more feedback from the community side. So uh, I will give a presentation about Ray and the Kubray. Um, and I think uh, uh I think we can firstly uh, introduce our team. Uh, a uh, Provin, would you mind to introduce yourself? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, yes, I will introduce myself. Sorry, I, I was trying to keep it low because I have a kid in the background. It's too early in the morning, <laughs> so. Uh, I'm Praveen. I'm one of the engineering managers at uh, Anyscale. I work with Kaishan, Hong Chao, and Archit here, uh, who are uh, in Kubray. So i uh, very curious to learn from you folks on the process. Yeah, and uh, Archit, would you mind to introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm Archit. Uh, like Praveen mentioned, I work with Kaishan and Hong Chao on Kubray. Uh, Hong Chao, would you mind to introduce yourself? Yeah, yeah, so hi. So I'm Hong Chao. So I also work on the Kubernetes and, and previously I also work on Kubernetes and a lot of open source stuff. All right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. And, and uh, there are still uh, some uh, Kubernetes contributors from the community that also attend this meeting. Uh, Andrew, would you mind let's briefly introduce Joseph? So. Hey, I'm Andrew. Um, I work at Google on GKE, and um, I've also been working with folks here um, contributing to the Gubray project. Yeah, and uh, uh, Ichan, would you mind to introduce yourself? Yeah, hello. Uh, I'm I'm Ichan. Uh, I'm one of the Gubray contributors. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, uh, Ted, uh, would you mind to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Uh, I'm Ted. I work for IBM. Uh, I contribute to Kubray and Project Code Player um, and OpenShift AI. Yeah, and I think uh, 
here is uh, some uh some folks from the uh Kubernetes in N scale and uh, some uh Kubernetes contributors. So I think I can start the uh, I can start my presentation. That's good. Okay. I'll come over. Uh, can 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 you guys see my screen? Yep. Okay. Nice. Yeah, and uh, uh, today's topic is that uh, I will talk about like, how to build a future-proof AI platform with Kubernetes. Uh, Kubernetes is a Ray and uh, Kubernetes. And my name is Kai Xun Chen. And uh, this is a very brief introduction about me. I'm a software engineer in Nscale, and I pretty like the open source and uh, I maintain several projects and contribute to several projects. Yeah, and uh, this is uh, today's agenda. Uh, I will not uh, dive into too much uh, uh, technical detail here, and uh, I will leave more time for the QA and uh, for uh, some feedback from the community. Yeah, uh, I think the first is that uh, this is a slide that's from the, our joint talk with Google uh, in the KubeCon 2023. Yeah, the first is that AI is all around you and uh, you can see there are a lot of company. And uh, I think uh, a lot of people maybe use that uh, every day, like the ChatGPT, like Uber, like the TikTok, uh, like like use the uh, DoorDash and the distant music on the Spotify. Uh, and uh, all of them use Ray to build their ML platform. And uh, most of them use Kubray. So, uh, so I think Kubra is currently a very, very popular uh, ML AI platform solution on the Kubernetes. Yeah, and uh, because uh, because I am not sure, uh, do you guys uh, understand Ray or not? So I will very briefly introduce Ray before I start uh, the following uh, topics. Sounds uh, good. Yeah, I think the main, the main idea for Ray is the infinite laptop. Uh, you can think like uh when we program on the our local laptop, we have the three elements. Uh, we need to write a function and the class and the variable. And then rate the rate abstraction is very different. Uh, unlike most of the distributed system, the abstraction is designed for a specific kind of the workload. For example, like a Spark, Spark have like the data frame and data set, and it is the abstraction is mainly for the data processing. And then for Ray, uh, we have one-on-one -on -one mapping for the programming elements. And we have like a task. Task is a remote function. And the actor is a remote class. And object is a remote variable. So uh, you just need to add an annotation on your Python script. And then you can convert your, uh, the, convert your Python script to the distributed version. And you don't need to really understand the distributed system. Yeah, so uh, our, our Ray is the tool that to enable you to program in the distributed system as if you are uh, working on your laptop. Yeah, so I think it is a, a much easier and a much uh, general purpose. And uh, one of the good things for this feature is that uh, before Ray, I think the, the data science workflow will be like this. Maybe data scientists need to write the Python code and train the model with their local data set. And then if the performance is okay, and then uh, they may need to add, as the ML engineer, to rewrite it into the distributed system version, like use the Meridius, like use Spark, and then uh, train the model. But if the, uh, if the model has any issue in the prod production environment, the data scientists need to debug with their Python local script instead of the distributed version of Python script. But in the Ray, because a local script and a distributed system of script is very similar, it's almost the same. So uh, the, the data science can very easily to reproduce the error that's in their local environment. Yeah, so I think this is one of the uh, important uh killer feature for Ray. And then the next is that uh oh we can talk about that. Uh and the next is that uh we can after 
for the last slide, we introduced the reactor and the red test and the red adjust. And uh, this is the abstraction for the red core. Uh, if you guys are familiar with like the spark, it's like you can think it like a spark core or a Meridius core. Yeah, and the red core provided this abstraction. And then we built several AI libraries uh, based on the red core, including like a data processing, training, tuning, and the serving. And then we provide two open source solutions. Uh, one is on the Kubernetes, which is the Kubray. And the one is on a virtual machine, like the uh, AWS EC2 and the GCP uh, GCE. Uh, and uh, I think currently uh, Kubray is uh, for our open source offering. I think most users use Kubray as their, uh, uh, so that they can also uh, they can also use the ability, the ecosystem of the Kubernetes. So I think most of our users choose to use Kubray as their open source solution. Yeah, and the, and the next is that I will talk about uh, the AI platform we saw Ray and the Kubray. Uh, I think the first is that because before the Ray, uh, there is no, uh, no Unify AI runtime. So a user need to uh if you want to build an ML platform, typically you will install a different system and the each system for a different uh purpose. For example, uh maybe I can use a Spark for the data processing. And then uh and then if I want to do the training, uh maybe I need to install like the TensorFlow operator, PyTorch operator, XGBoost operator, and then we I need to and for a serving, maybe I need to use like a K-serve, K-native, and like a TF-serve. Yeah, so uh, you may require a different system uh, for a different kind of a workload. This is because the uh, ML workload is very special. Uh, it consists of many different step workload, like a data processing, training, tuning, and serving. And uh, each, uh, each workload has different requirements. Uh, for example, like the distributed training, you may need to use the uh the GAN scheduler, and uh, if for the serving, maybe you need to have the auto scaling feature, and uh, maybe you need to have the higher ability feature. Yeah, so different kind of uh, workload require different uh infra requirements, so you need to install many different kind of the system to do that. But uh, there are some issue about that is that, for example, if you uh, if you want to cover a uh, end-to-end ML life cycle, no matter your workload is big or small, you require to install a lot of system, uh, a lot of parts that in the in your Kubernetes cluster. I think if you use something like a uh, like a Kubeflow or Apache Submarine, you can see that you require to install uh maybe. 20, 30 paths that's in the Kubernetes cluster to cover a very minimum end-to-end -end life cycle. So I think it is a very heavy way. And the, the second is that uh, the user experience is fragment, fragmented. Right, so, and to group the system together, a users, for example, like a data scientist, after they finish their Python script, they may need to, uh, they may need to know how to build a Docker image and then uh, they may need to uh, write some YAML files. And then they may need to use like a workflow architecture like the like the airflow or a flight. And then uh to come to group different systems together and uh, like the uh, data processing and training, training and serving. Yeah, and uh, honestly, most of the, oh go ahead. Um uh, Steven. Hi, hi. Um do you uh you had mentioned uh, an example of like developing in a Spark system previously, um, where if there's a problem, you have to develop it and test it locally, and that's a totally different environment. Is is that really because each developer doesn't have their own Spark cluster essentially because it's such a a large large distributed system? Is is that the problem that the Ray is is helping? Uh, I I think it is mainly for that. The first is that I would say that Spark is not that suitable for the ML workload. And then uh, and the second is that I think uh, most of the data scientists doesn't understand the distributed system. 
yeah, so uh, they may require another distributed system engineer to rewrite their uh read their Python code maybe into Spark to do a distributed training. Gotcha. Okay, so it's really abstracting the the parts that they may not understand the infra the core infrastructure stuff, making it easier for for what they do understand. Yeah, yeah, I think it is. Uh, I think because it is a almost one on one mapping and and the as a script with Ray and without Ray will be very similar. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Ray also provides some like auto scaling and architecture feature. So, uh, you uh. So write the code in the distributed system is very similar to the uh, program in your local laptop. I think uh, if you have any experience about like the uh, Meridius, like Spark, uh, mm -hmm. you may understand that. I think Spark, if you don't use like the, if you don't use like the uh, C core, Spark C core, I think uh, the experience, uh, if you handle a, a handle a, a data in your local laptop and the handle in the Spark cluster, I think the experience will be very different. Sure. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Uh. And uh. Um. Uh, yeah. And I think uh. Uh. The the third one is that uh because if you install a lot of different system for different kinds of workload in the ML model lifecycle, I think uh, it will lack the flexibility. But uh, I I think cu currently the the pace of AI is pre pretty rapid. So, uh, like the from the traditional AI to the reinforce uh, to the deep learning and to the reinforced learning, and uh, for the large language model and uh, for the currently, I think uh, a lot of people focus on the multi model. So I think uh, it may the different system, the different ML uh workload require different ML uh different system requirements, uh and uh, if you just build a lot of different component in your cluster. I think it is not that easy to uh change it uh based on the different kind of the ML workload. Uh for example, like the before large language model, more uh, most of the people focus on the training. But for the large language model, it is a different story. Most people focus on the uh, serving, and we can talk about it later. And uh, the uh, the bottleneck move from the computation bound to the memory bound. So uh, the system will be very different. Okay. And uh, Kubernetes is Kubernetes is a Ray on Kubernetes, and uh, Ray provides a general purpose computing engine. So uh, you can cover your uh end to end life cycle with the Ray infrastructure, and uh, so it will be very lightweight, and you can just start a uh, one Kubernetes operator pod and uh, from and the one Red Hat pod, and then uh you can. You can start to program your cluster, and we have the auto scaling feature. It will scale up and scale down based on the application level knowledge. Yeah, because like the, uh, like the Kubernetes native uh auto scaler, it is based on the like the uh resource usage, and then we sell the knowledge of the application level knowledge. Uh, but Ray have the application level knowledge, so it can do some more smarter, uh. More more smart auto scan decision, and uh, the data scientist doesn't need to uh in the workflow they uh it will have a unified use experience, user experience. I think that is why the a lot of companies decide to use the array to build their ML platform. And I think uh because here is the Kubernetes community, so I think some some guys may. I uh, think that why do we need to both of the Ray and the Kubernetes? Because both of them are the resource architecture, but it is a bit different is that a uh, Ray focus more on the computation side, like uh, the task and the actor as a scheduling unit. And uh, the Kubernetes focus more on the uh, deployment side, like uh, the pod is, is, is a scheduling unit. And uh, we can, uh, the Kubernetes just combine them together so that uh, we can have the benefit from each side. Yeah, and uh, Kubernetes provides three uh, CRDs here. The first one is for the Ray cluster. A Ray cluster is a match the life cycle of Ray cluster and consists of several parts, including a Ray Hat and a Ray Worker. 
and the, it provides down the auto scaling feature uh, and uh, the full tolerance feature. And then we also provide a different pattern to, for a different kind of the workload. Like the, for the best job, we provide a, like a rate job. It will create a rate cluster and submit a job uh, when the cluster is ready. And then uh, after the job finish, uh, rate Kubra will recycle the rate cluster to avoid the idle uh, resource. And then the rate service is that for the serve model service. Well, it will create a rate cluster and uh, submit a rate serve, deploy rate serve on it. And uh, we also provide some uh, the Euro downtime upgrade and the high ability feature. So uh, user can uh, select depends on their needed. Yeah, and uh, the next is that because uh, recently, uh, most of the focus is on the last language model. So uh, we will talk about uh, why does the Kubernetes is suitable for the LLM. Yeah, I think uh, before the large language model, I think the ML model life cycle will become like a, I, I simplify a lot of things, uh, like the data, data preparation, training, and the serving. Um, and uh, most of people put emphasis on the training because it requires a lot of GPU and uh, costs a lot of money. And uh, for serving, uh, at that time, because the model is small, so some, most, most of the model can use a single small GPU for inference, or they can, uh, or if something is not that latent sensitive, a user can also use the CPU for inference. And uh, at this moment, the, the bottleneck is the computation bound. And uh, for the large language model, it is a different story is that uh, because uh, only a few big tech will pre-train the model because it is very expensive. It, it will cost uh, several million dollars for each train. So most users use the open source uh, pre-train models and then uh, use the fun fun uh, open source foundation model and then fine tune it with their data set and then serve the model. And uh, uh, I think a lot something like the Meta Lama too. Yeah. And then uh, it become very expensive is that uh, because a one a one GPU is not enough for serve the model because uh, like the Lama 270B and uh, typically we for the serving, we will use the FP16, which is two bytes for each variable, each parameter. So the Lama 270B require uh, uh, one, one forty, 140 gigabytes of GPU memory at least, yeah, to for to serve in the model. So it's moved from the computation bottleneck to the memory bottleneck. So uh, the optimization will be very different. We there are some techniques like the video and fresh attention to do that. So I think this can also uh support my point before is that the ML the ML workload change very rapidly, so we need to change our infra very uh flexible. Yeah, and the uh, Kubernetes can have some uh good feature for the like large language model, for example, like the auto scaling, right? Because the serving, the serving, the workload of serving is that you cannot determine. You cannot uh, predict the traffic. And so you need to be able to scale up and scale down uh, based on the traffic. And then the second is that uh, at this moment, uh, we see more and more people because the high-end GPUs are in high demand. So uh, they want to use a different kind of the workload from a different, uh, from a different cloud and a different kind of hardware, like a GPU, TPU, and the CPU, and the uh, Sometimes they, some people also uh, uh, explore some uh, AI accelerator. Yeah, and uh, uh, here is the demo. I will, uh, we have a video that uh, we, we record for the uh, race summit and the KubeCon 2023. Uh, but I think I will not, oh, go ahead, uh, Steven. Or right, Steven has a question. Okay. Yeah, I was just curious about the auto scaling a little bit. Is that uh, like tied into the, the pod auto scaler at all, or is that? Uh, can you talk a little bit about how that kind of 
kind of works, how you monitor oh, the... Okay, okay. Uh, yeah, I think uh, for the Kubernetes side, then auto scaling has three levels. Uh, because at first we said, uh, we talk about the uh, ray test and actor. This is an abstraction of ray and uh, some ray application will scale up and scale down the uh, ray the ray actor and the test. For example, like the ray serve. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, everything under the ray serve is a ray core. Uh, it will create a replica to serve a request and each replica is a ray actor. And the ray serve will scale up and scale down the uh, the number of replica, which is the actor that's on the traffic. And then uh, the ray auto scatter, if it is uh, if it doesn't have enough resource to schedule the new replica, it will try to trigger the ray auto scaling. It will create a ray no new ray node. And the, a new ray node in the Kubra is a ray pod. So Kubra is responsible for creating a new ray pod. And the uh, ray server is responsible for the create a new ray actor. And then uh, the Kubernetes scatter, Kubernetes auto scatter. Uh, it's not the scope of a Kubra, but a typical user will use it like with the like a GK autopilot. And then uh, if the Kubernetes cluster don't have enough resource to schedule the new ray pod, uh, the GK autopilot may add a new Kubernetes node into the Kubernetes cluster. Uh, so there are three levels of the auto scaling in the ray and the Kubra. Uh, one is for the ray actor and the task and the and the ray pod, and the third one is the Kubernetes node. Uh, is this uh, is it on the uh reply your question? Yeah, I I, I I think so. You're you're saying um basically the the logic or the you have sort of a control logic or your own kind of control plane handling the uh your own scaling launching your own pods that that kind of thing as as needed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, yeah, I mean, can I, if I may add a little bit more, uh, race service, uh, you can think about is the underlying library that is uh, facilitating serving application. And it has a lot of configurations itself as to like how many requests each replica. It speaks in the language of replica, not necessarily pod or instance. Okay. And it is it is trying to pack as many replicas within an instance based on the uh, constraints that the replica needs, right? Like how much memory or your configuration. And based on your uh, auto scaling parameters at the reserve library, which is like, hey, I don't want each replica to take more than X number of requests or like whatever configurations it spins up new replicas. Now, it could so happen that let's say you have an instance which has multiple GPUs and the next replica could be placed on the same instance. In that case, it really doesn't need to scale up any instances or pods. Mm -hmm. But sometimes what has to happen is it might have to spin up. So library is not capable of, that's when it signals, uh, that's when Kubray comes into picture and orchestrates that with Kubernetes. Uh, with Kubernetes. Now, uh, what some, uh, uh, but there are a lot of uh, existing installations of Kubernetes which um, involve integration with the Kubernetes autoscaler itself. So that's the third level of hierarchy. Does it make sense to differentiate what Ray library is trying to do, Ray service doing versus Kubernetes Kubernetes is doing? Uh, yes, I, I I think so. That that was very helpful. Thank you. Um, at, just as a follow on, out of curiosity, what is a typical size of a Ray cluster? You just can you start with the uh, you know very small and kind of grow as needed. Yeah, I think uh from our perspective, uh, I I think we have the uh, because we we have some telemetry, but not everyone exposed their telemetry. But uh, uh for from my perspective, like some startup may have like the twenty node for the model serving, and then we also see the cluster that has the more than thousand nodes. Yeah, but uh, we cannot talk with your company. Sure. Okay. Yeah, so I think it is uh very very flexible and uh, because sometimes uh maybe a company that they forget to disable the telemetry and then we see, yeah, and uh, there are a lot of the uh, resource there. Some follow up questions. Uh, you you meant twenty nodes, uh, actual machines or actual parts or. Oh, I I think this is a, a very 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 small startup use cases and uh, 
I think this is not. I think uh, the, let me check last. Mm. I think it's for the a uh, twenty Kubernetes node. Yeah, I I think in the but I think this is recently because I I recently in this month I start to uh try to talk with some a uh, Kubernetes user and this is the user that uh discussed their uh class size for me and. Uh, I think we. I also uh, chat with a lot of big company, but they don't is, uh, don't disclose their cluster size for me. Uh, like uh, we recently just checked with like the, uh, uh, ByteDance, uh, ByteDance they provide some uh cloud service for their customer based on Kubernetes, and I think like attention, attention, uh, attention is a game company, very very famous company in Asia. They also provide some uh serverless stable diffusion models for their artists. They all the artists in the tension. And then like we also talk with like the uh like the Ali, Ali, Ali Cloud. It is also a very big uh company in China. Right. They also want to provide the related ray service based on Kubernetes for their Kubernetes service uh customer. And uh, and I also talk with like eBay, something like that. And uh, but they don't tell me. Uh, their cluster size, and then we ho have also have some a lot of the, uh, uh, big company user, but they don't tell me the cluster size, because I I think maybe you can remember that I I have a slide that have a lot of company logo, uh, most of them use Kubernetes, uh, to deploy their, uh, Ray cluster, I I would say that's more than eighty percent, in that uh in that slide. That makes sense. Yeah, thanks for the answers. Are you going to talk about um, DRA or are you working with the Kubernetes community or with DRA or that's something that you haven't talked to them about? Oh, yeah. Uh, you said talk about community? Yeah, DRA, the dynamic resource allocation. I don't know if you have anything uh, on the slides, but... Um... Okay, oh, I, I have some a slide for the... For the community to introduce the community, I think maybe we can maybe we can just uh, skip the, uh skip this demo because I think uh, we have a similar one in the in the KubeCon and the, in the Red Summit. So if you guys are interesting, you can uh, take a look at our, uh KubeCon video or our a uh, Red Summit talk. Uh yeah, so, sorry, my question was more about DRA. I don't know if you heard about it. It's dynamic resource allocation. That's uh. It's a feature that the Kubernetes community started working on with the NVIDIA folks. Uh, but if you're not familiar, that's fine. And we can chat offline. Sorry, I, uh, I, I, I didn't really understand the, the feature that you mentioned. Uh, would you mind to just type it? Uh, DRA dynamic. Oh, sorry. I, I, I didn't know that. Uh, it is a... Maybe I can. Yeah. So let's follow up on uh offline. Uh, and maybe um, maybe I can connect you with the community and. Because uh, I think one of the issues with the GPUs uh, and Kubernetes is that you have to pre-partition your uh, resources uh, before you run your workload. Um, but with um, DRA, uh, you will be able to dynamically change these resources. Uh, GPUs and, and memory within the GPUs, right? So one of the issues is memory in GPUs when you serve uh, uh, large models like LLMs. Uh, so I don't know if uh, Kubernetes has already solved this problem already, uh, but the Kubernetes community is, is working with oh, God. Yeah, folks at so NVIDIA to solve this issue. Um, yeah, I think for the GPU, yeah, for 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 for, uh, for for something like the GPU isolation, something like that. I think uh currently, uh, I from from my perspective, I think the GPU support on Kubernetes is not that mature. So I think if there's new feature, I think it will be very helpful. And then I think that is also one of the important important products uh, we want to contribute to CNCF and uh, to connect with more uh more folks from like a Kubernetes ecosystem. Because uh we we are trying to figure out, uh, we are trying to figure out how to uh, integrate the Ray and the Kubernetes with the Kubernetes ecosystem, 
yeah, I think there are still some of the uh That's some good. of the gap left from from our knowledge because uh, uh more most of our experience is from like the VM side, something like that, and the from the computation. And I think if we uh Kubernetes ecosystem can share some insight for the deployment side, I think it will be very helpful. Yeah, sounds good. Sounds good. So, so, so it sounds like there there's an opportunity for collaboration. I think Andrew uh, posted a couple of comments. Uh, uh, so Kubernetes will benefit from from this, uh, uh, but Kubernetes doesn't need to significantly significantly adapt to adopt this new feature. Yeah, so that's something yeah. that you can. Yeah, like I think Kubernetes definitely can be like an early adopter and provide like a lot of early feedback on the feature. But I I don't see us like needing to significantly like re-architect Kubray or change anything significant to kind of take advantage of those things. Yeah, so the idea is just not for the projects to re-architect themselves. So it's also, to, it's just to maybe how they can fit in there. Or, mm -hmm. or it, since this is like a new feature, it's also a way to shape this new feature right? and how, how it can actually adapt to existing ecosystems or eco uh, existing projects like Kubray. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Uh, maybe I can go ahead or. Yeah, sounds okay, good. Thanks. And then next is that uh, we we have a we have a very cool demo for the end to end large language model lifecycle for the with the Cubre, and this is a very simple demo, and uh, we have uh, some video. But I think uh maybe today I will not play the video, and if you are interested, you can check out on our resubmit code talk or the Archie and the. the Google's Winston stock that's on uh, Cube, KubeCon 2023. Yeah, and uh, here's an example, because we have three CRD, and uh, for example, you can use a red cluster for the, with the Jupyter notebook for the prototyping, and it support the auto scaling. So for the prototyping, uh, you only, it will only scale up a new red part, maybe GPU part when you try to run some workload. So it can save a lot of money and then uh, you can use like the ray jar for the fine tuning because the the workload is deterministic, and then you can uh, after a fine tune maybe you can use a ray service, and then we have the some large language model library to serve the model, and then we can build the large language model application like by like the land chain or gradual. Yeah, and this is a video, and uh, I will skip it, and then this is the. Uh, video for the serving the model, I also skip it. And then this is some very simple example that you can build your large language model application. After fine tune the model, we can use the ray service to serve it. And then uh, we can use like a range chain and gradio. Gradio provide a, a front end and the range chain to, uh, to grow the, the, the open AI compatible API and the, the gradio together. So a uh, user can serve the very easily to fine tune their model and uh, suffer a large language model and build their application there. And uh, here's a demo video, I'll skip, skip it. And then uh, finally is that we will introduce uh, introduce the Kubernetes community. Yeah, I think uh, recently we, we see the massive graph of the, in the number of Kubernetes clusters. And uh, this is the top uh, public uh, data point is that this is from the uh our our founder uh Ian Stoika's keynote in the race summit this year from January to September there is the a fifteen x fifteen x of the growth of the Kubernetes cluster so I think it has already been the dominant solution for the great deployment and the second is that uh it has the more than uh one hundred contributors. So it is a very diverse uh, community. And like uh, we also have uh, some active contributor like from like the uh, uh, IBM Red Hat from the OpenShift side and uh, some, uh, some folks from like the uh, Kubernetes, Kubernetes maintainer like uh, Andrew. And uh, we also have uh, very uh, closely collaborate with like the uh, Google and the uh, Kubernetes ecosystem. For example, uh, we have some co collaboration now is like the uh, Kubernetes Gateway API. And uh, something like uh, the queue, the K, the queue, the scheduler, and uh, have like a TPU integration. So uh, we are working very closely with the Kubernetes uh, community. 
and uh, we have a lot of the external blocks. I think like the Google Cloud that's published two or three blocks for the Kubernetes uh, in this year, and uh, Spotify, DoorDash, Red Hat, and like a Sensara, Instacart, a lot of them that share their experience about how to build the like, ML platform that's based on Kubernetes. Yeah, and uh, uh, yeah, and uh, this is an introduction for the Ray and the Kubernetes. And uh, right, and uh, we are very gratefully uh, appreciate if uh, you guys can provide some feedback. And uh, because I know that there are some different level of the CNCF project. And uh, uh, do you have any suggestion for our next step if we want to uh, donate the project to the CNCF? Yeah, and uh, thank you guys very much. And uh, and later we can for like the feedback and uh, some QA. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot for the presentation. That was a great overview. So you do have a lot of uh, end users already, right? So how can you can you share how many end users you have uh, approximately? And you say users? Yeah. Um uh, uh, can we I don't know the exact number of companies. I can I know I, I think... a few of them. Few of them which can I know a few of them on top of my head that that are using it, but I don't know exact number. I mean there are a lot of small companies that use, but yeah, go ahead. I think it's quite a bit based on the slide that you shared initially. And and it's oh, just yeah. Yeah, skip yeah. rate is not it's not ray separately, right? So it's just Q ray. So this one uh I think this one uh, most user in this slide use Kubray, but I I'm not sure that can I share which company use Kubernetes or which not. Yeah, so but yeah. I, I would say most of users here use Kubernetes. Yeah, so, so my guess is that you could probably go for incubation instead of sandbox in the CNCF. Uh, sand, sandbox is uh, for early projects, but uh, just, just seem to be more mature and then you have a lot of end users, uh, but it will be good to identify some of those. Uh, because when the projects go for incubation, uh, the TOC actually conducts interviews with the end users and um, they try to understand uh, how they're using the project and uh, how important it is and uh, whether they're satisfied with the with the maturity of the project or with with the with the you know how they are getting their issues resolved for example uh, if, if, if they're getting resolved in a timely manner and those type of things right so so that's my recommendation i think uh, uh incubation might be uh the step uh the next step and the uh, from that po uh, point of view the process is finding a toc sponsor in the cncf and uh, that person will work with the project maintainers creating a due diligence document and there's a format in the CNCF to start creating that. So, and we can share that. Can, can you say about what is TLC or? Uh, TLC, the Technical Oversight Committee. Oversight. Technical. Got it, got it. So, uh, so, uh, you you think that like maybe we can try to start from the incubation instead of the sandbox, and yes. then we need to collect some of our, uh, some of like the feedback or something from our users to prove that um this is a very important project for them. Yeah, and exactly. We need to uh, look for the technical oversight community sponsor. So one one person is technical oversight. I can. Uh, I can uh, evangelize this with the TOC uh, to try to find a sponsor. I it, The other uh, step that you can take is I should create a, a GitHub issue under the CNCF TOC GitHub repository. Okay. T uh, with the, with the, in your intention to, uh, to apply for incubation. Okay, got it. Yeah. So Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, yeah, because I think uh, I'm not sure like a TLC because I think there are a lot of different seek and the worker group and the uh, the tech. 
So is TLC have the different TLC, like an AI TLC, like a scheduling TLC? No, no, there's there's just 11 members from a variety of different companies. Uh, there's no uh, particular specialization for each one of them. Uh, so generally, uh, but we do have uh, within the tags, the, there's T, what we call the TOC liaisons, and and they generally work with the tags uh, on that specific area. So we have in tag runtime, we have three liaisons. Um, it doesn't mean that they know uh, the most about uh, the runtime area, but they're generally working with us. Uh, but yeah, so I guess to answer your question, there's no specific... Um, knowledge from the TOC members and uh, appointed to some specific area or some specific area that just kind of take on projects based on their interest. Got it, got it. So, uh, so, do, so uh, we just need to uh, look for the sponsor from the TOC. Do we need to like uh, communicate with like a, a, another tag or another stick or another a worker group? Yeah, so under the tech runtime, we have the working group uh, artificial intelligence. I think it might be a good idea to to maybe even present there uh, at some point. Uh, so that that group is actually pretty early, uh, but there is a lot of interest there because of the LLM and artificial intelligence uh, hype, if, if if you will. Right? So. Uh, there will be stuff uh, uh, announced probably before the next KubeCon in Paris. So that's uh, that's another group that, that, that KubeRay can engage with. And I think I can actually help out too with uh, with sharing this presentation in, in that group as well. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I think it's pretty, pretty helpful. Does that answer your questions? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So, uh, is there any any other feedbacks that uh, uh, how how can we do that to improve the poss possibility that to uh join the CNCF incubation? Yeah, will be appreciated. Yeah. So yeah, I would say just gather your information uh, about end users. Uh, make sure that you have a grasp from the stats of the project, like how many contributors, how many organizations are contributing to the uh, project, the different organizations. You have Google, I think you have any scale, maybe you have some others. So gather information about those. Got it, got it. Okay. Oh, yeah, also look at the, the CNCF TOC repo. I don't have it handy, but uh, you can Google for uh, CNCF uh, incubation due diligence uh, template. And then you can look at some of the information that maybe the TOC is actually looking for, uh, for a, a particular project to to get into that stage, right? To, to put on the due diligence document. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I'll, I'll do that. Okay, got it. So I think for the next step is that maybe we will uh, try to connect with the CNCF TOC and then uh, gather some end user information and the contributor information. Yeah, and then uh, also try to keep in touch with the like the AI worker group, uh, AI work group and the some, uh, some tag or something like that. Got it. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if it uh, applies to other tags. So we have tag observability, tag storage, tag app delivery, tag contributor strategy, uh, tag environmental sustainability. Maybe in, in, tag environmental sustainability might be one that might be interested in terms of like running AI workloads, uh, trying to reach that net zero goal that a lot of organizations are trying to do. Right? Uh, Ricardo, can tag run us for us? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we 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 can sponsor. So, essentially, when uh, you create a due diligence document for incubation, there's a section that says tag assessment, 
a tag recommendation and we we can actually recommend the project uh, yeah i understand i i used to be a uh, in tech application uh delivery so so yeah i think like so so yeah we, we, we will go with like tech runtime and then we will find a poc and i think that's the best route so, yeah so that's great. i guess you know the process so that's great oh, God. well thanks Yes. Okay. Yeah. I think uh it is pretty very helpful. Yeah. And uh uh, if, if I think maybe we still have a couple minutes, and uh, if you guys have any question or any feedback that for us can help help the Cubra, we can um uh, can do better before we trying to apply for the uh donation for CNCF. It will be very appreciated. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the questions. I think uh, we have Stephen. Uh, I think we have Joe Roberts, who are not. I don't know if Joel's part of the project. But Stephen is not part of the project at that point. I think some of the other folks on the call are primarily from the project. Yeah, I I think I'm I'm good. Thank you for your uh for your presentation. I, I appreciate all of the answers to the questions as well. Thanks. I I just put a, a link in the chat. I think a lot of what Ricardo was talking about um, for the oh, process yeah, documentation. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's the due diligence guidelines there as well as uh, incubation process, things like that. Yeah, thanks. thanks. Yeah, I think it's pretty helpful. Yeah, I am, uh, I am familiar with how does the Apache Software Foundation works, but I didn't understand. <laughs> How does the CNCF works? And then that's the that's the TOC repo as well. Um, I, I I believe to where you'd file your your issue there as well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's pretty helpful. Yeah, you could go for sandbox if you like to, but I think it's more mature than just sandbox. So you if you go to sandbox, uh, you'll find that maybe you'll want to go for incubation pretty quickly. But yeah, so, okay. Yeah, thanks, thanks guys. Yeah, and uh, uh, so if, uh, yeah, and, uh, and so if, if I, I'm not sure that it's that anyone still have any question or feedback or? That's about it from me, so. Okay. So I think if uh if you guys we can, have... we, yeah we can uh communicate asynchronously on the Slack channel if there are any other things or and feel free to reach out to the Tag Runtime channel to or to anybody in, yeah who's yeah. a who's a you know, Tag Chair or or Steven or anybody in the community yeah thanks yeah so uh I think uh. Yeah, thank you guys for uh giving us feedback. It's pretty very helpful. Yeah, so and uh, uh I and I think I, I will try to uh, I will keep in touch with you guys and uh try to make this happen. And uh, thank you guys very much. Perfect. Sounds great. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoy the holidays. Thanks. Bye. Bye.